So I want to talk a little bit today about uh, your recent book, uh, Bob Brookmeyer in conversation with Dave Ravello, as well as your work as a composer and uh, some of your insights into some of the things that Bob Brookmeyer taught you and the, his approach to writing. Uh, but I thought we could start off with uh, your role at Eastman. Maybe you could give a brief uh, description of your role at Eastman and what you're doing nowadays and how you started out and what brought you there. Sure. Um... First of all, thanks for asking me to do this. I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful project that you're doing here in documenting composers and, and musicians, so thanks for doing this. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate you being here. The, um, let's see, so I guess back in uh, mm, the late 1980s, I applied to Eastman. I did my undergraduate degree at Youngstown State University, and mm -hmm. I grew up in basically a suburb of Youngstown, Ohio. And Tony Leonardi, great bass player, who had played with Woody Herman and many people, he was the jazz instructor at Youngstown State University. So I studied with him and a great writer named Sam D'Angelo in that area that I studied with all the way up pretty much from high school to the day I left to come to Eastman. And Sam was amazing and had great ears. I've been very fortunate with the teachers that I've been able to have. And so mm. I applied at Eastman. And I never really thought that I would get in there, but I didn't apply to any other grad schools. I applied to Eastman, and they accepted me. And so I really wanted to study with Ray Wright, Rayburn Wright, that of course mm -hmm. wrote Inside the Score and also On the Track, the film scoring book. And so I came to Rochester and did my master's degree with Ray Wright, and it was incredible. I mean, he was, I think for all of us that studied with Ray Wright, there's just a card that we carry that, you know, and, and that's so many people. It's it's Maria Schneider, it's John Fedchok, it's Jeff Beal, it's Dave Sloniker, it's Ellen Rowe, who teaches in Michigan, like great writers and teachers and professional musicians, so many more than that. And so to be part of all of that is is um, a, a, a wonderful thing for me. And sure. so that's what got me to Rochester. And then from there, I was getting a lot of copy work back in the pen and ink days, long before there was Finale Sibelius or even Professional Composer, if you remember that one, that was kind of not so great, but it was something. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I was copying for Ray Wright, Bill Dobbins, and uh, Donald Hunsberger, wind ensemble things, and every other year at that point, the Eastman wind ensemble was traveling to Japan, and so it was really, and Hunsberger would write an hour-long program, brand new, it was all pen and ink, was great work, so just Rochester was a good place as far as being a copyist before the industry kind of disappeared when the computer programs, when we all now, we do our own, mostly we all do our own score and parts. Sure. And so uh, was that time, it was really great. I mean, just the, and like I said, Ray Wright, the time at Eastman right then, so inspiring and the energy was incredible. And during that time, the other thing that was going on was the Arrangers Holiday, which Ray Wright started even when he was still in New York City as chief arranger and conductor at Radio City Music Hall for all those years. In his vacation, two-week vacation, I think, from Radio City Music Hall, he would come up here and teach for the two weeks. And so he brought in the great arranger Manny Album. So Ray Wright and Manny Album co-led the Arrangers Workshop at Eastman. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I was fortunate enough to be even part of the last couple years of that, which was really a great thing. But it was, it was a lot of professional musicians that would come and get the experience to write for strings and studio orchestra. Maybe they were pretty, they were, you know, accomplished writing for jazz orchestra or writing in other situations, but getting to write for strings every day, like every note basically that you wrote got played and recorded. And so it was just an incredible, intense time that nobody slept for two weeks that was in the program. <laughs> and so that was going on. And so, so that was two weeks of, of writing and, and having the music played and working on arranging and working together. It's sort of a general workshop for two weeks. Yes. And at the very end of that, there was a performance that would bring in a, a, a legendary jazz guest artist. And so the, some of the students in the workshop would write for the guest artist. And then Ray and Manny had quite a sense of humor and they would create some kind of skit and whatever that skit was then all the people in the workshop had to write these 30 seconds or this minute and your part had to line up with the next person's part and the next person's part 
I remember one year it was something having to do with like an operating room and it was hysterical and there were these jokes and, and Manny Album especially was quite the jokester and uh, you know with the handlebar mustache and Manny was great because he was the only guy I know that he, when the phone rang he would pick it up and say goodbye and then when it was done talking he would say hello and just like <laughs> Silly things like that. But, sure, yeah, yeah. But Manny was, uh, you know, people don't talk too much about Manny, it seems, anymore. But he was really, really great. And mm. and he turned me on to the love of Indian food. Had no idea. Okay. Coming from my little town in Ohio, Manny's like, oh, we're going to go out to dinner. And uh, so many things. So Manny was great. And I talk about him because then that led into the Brookmeyer thing, which was the way that I met Brookmeyer well, before that even, you know, the album, the Blue Album, you know, we talk about the, the Brookmeyer Blue Album and the Bl Brookmeyer White Album, the two albums he did with Mel Lewis and the Jazz Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the Beatles White Album, so the Make Me Smile album, like, the oh, the Brookmeyer, that's on the Brookmeyer White Album. <laughs> it's it's sure. the Beatles, you know. But, yeah, yeah. But I remember, you know, I so I went to um, undergrad school where I grew up, like I said. So I commuted from home at my parents' house. And in my upstairs bedroom, I remember, you know, I had a record player, like we all did. And while I was a student at Youngstown State, I was writing early pieces for their band and for the band there. And there was a baritone saxophonist. And he said, he came up to me and he was a very big Pepper Adams fan. And he came up mm -hmm. to me and he said, which that's a good thing, of course, Pepper was amazing. But he came up yeah. to me and he said, you know, uh, there's a new record and with uh, Bob Brookmeyer, you, you're interested in writing. You, sh you should get this record, and it, you know you should. They have one more copy. You should go to the record store in the mall, and get this record. It's called Bob Brookmeyer, Composer Ranger, with Mel Lewis and the Jazz Orchestra. And so, leading up to that, you know, I'd heard a, a lot of Thad's music, and you know Oliver Nelson, and all the things that we know, Basie, of course, and Ellington. And I remember, and we all talk about this with the Blue Album, putting the needle down on. I think Ding Dong Dang is the first cut, I think, on the LP. Yep. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my mind was blown and the whole world was changed. Like, wow, where does, where does this even come from? I say that in a certain way to me, it's like when I first heard The Rite of Spring. It's like, there seems to be like a gap from what was happening up to and then, junk, 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 junk. It's like, sure, where yeah. did that come from? Maybe not yeah. quite as dramatic, but still, Brookmeyer, I'm like, wow, ding, 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 ding. And the whole thing, bass trombone comes in on the good, wrong note. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. so at that time as a kid in you know, up in my room upstairs in the attic basically, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if someday I could meet Bob Brookmeyer, having no idea like where things would go. And so with Manny, I had found out that Manny was co teaching the BMI Jazz Composers workshop with Brookmeyer. Mm -hmm. And so when Manny was up here one of the summers for the Rangers holiday, I said, Man, you know, I I don't have like money to get to back and forth to New York from here, even on the train. But you know, I wish I could be part of that. And he said, "Well, let me let me let me check into it." And ultimately, it couldn't work. Like there wasn't funding to pay for my train ride back and forth. But I was happy that Manny had tried. So then the next thing that happened was Fred Sturm at that point was running the jazz program here at Eastman, mm -hmm. and he told me. I think he was, or we talked all the time, so he might have still been at Lawrence. But either way, he said, oh, Dave, because we always traded. What are you listening to? Oh, you got to check this thing out. you got to listen to this. you got to get the score. So he said, there's a new recording of Brookmeyer's called Electricity that's just dynamite. But it's only available in Europe. You should call Bob, you know, and just call him up. I'm sure he'll send you one. And I thought, you know, I tell the story the same way that Brookmeyer tell, told the story about when he wanted to take a lesson with Ludislawski. And Jan Brookmeyer actually has the framed telegram that Bob treasured from Ludislawski that said, Ludislawski awaits your call. And Bob talked about, I guess Brookmeyer was very funny too. People think he was kind of mean or salty, maybe a lot of people, but he was, he was very funny at times. And mm -hmm. he said that he would try to pick up the phone and dial the phone, just couldn't do it like it's Ludislawski. And then one day he dialed the phone and hoped that he got a busy signal, and he did. And like that's kind of so he never ended up talking to Ludislawski. But uh -huh. you know, it was I didn't know that story when I kind of had the same feeling. Like I don't know. I thought, well, I heard that Mulligan was pretty salty, and Brookmeyer and Mulligan like did a lot of work together. So I had the feeling like maybe Brookmeyer was maybe not so 
easy to talk to, which was sure. totally wrong. But I dialed the phone, and I was kind of hoping I'd get his answer machine so I could, and then, you know, this typical gruff voice. And like, So we started talking, and I said that I was calling him about the electricity CD, and he said, oh, I, I know about you. A Manny Album told me you're a great writer. And so I was like, wow, I had no idea that, so that Manny had kind of laid that back from when I was hoping to kind of be part of the BMI thing back in the late 80s. Sure, that's amazing. <laughs> so it's kind of a long story. I hope, it's, hope this is Oh, not no, go, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. That's great. And so then we talked and I said something about, you know, I said about the electricity CD and I said, uh, he said, oh yeah, I'll send you one. Um, and he said, besides being a composer, what else do you do? And I said, well, I'm a copyist. And that was right when computer copying and finale especially was kind of becoming stronger. He said, mm-hmm. oh, hand copying or computer? And I said, well, I do both, but I prefer to hand copy. And he said, oh, okay, well, I might need you. And I, he said, I'll send you the CDs. Nice talking to you. We hung up and and I thought, ah, Brooke Myers got the synthesizer in the big band. He's totally like forward thinking. I probably lost that gig. I probably screwed that up. He's probably all about hand co- or computer copying now. Mm-hmm. And about, I don't remember now, a couple weeks later, phone rang. It was Brooke Meyer. I said, ah, it's Brooke Meyer. I need you. And I'd like it hand copied. It's uh, a four moving suite for Clark Terry's 75th birthday, which that stuff is up on, some of it's up on YouTube now, with the Schleswig Holstein band before that band became Bob's new art band. It okay. was originally for the Schleswig Holstein Festival. And they did two years like that. They did one with Clark Terry as a guest and one with Mulligan as a guest. I think mm-hmm. it actually it might have been the other way around. I think Mulligan was the first guest and then Clark Terry. But the sure. Clark Terry but if you, one. If you search for that on, on YouTube, if you search for that name of that band and that, what year was it? Just in case you want to find it. Um, hmm, that's a good question. It's here. I'm not sure that I remember the year. But, sure. But it should come up pretty easily if you just Bob Brookmeyer, Clark Terry... Big band or Schleswig whole sure. time is the, okay, but uh, yeah. So, and once in a while, it seems that like the camera pans enough that you can see my hand copied parts on the on the stand. So cool, and uh, and it's a great performance. So that was the beginning of of that, and for me, copying for Brookmeyer and you know us knowing one another, and and I wish I would have taken a picture like it was before the the time when you know we take pictures of everything now. <laughs> it's sure. anything. Yeah, but yeah. But I mean, yeah. the stack of paper the manuscript paper that i copied that had FedEx to germany and the whole thing was huge and it was i thought at the time oh this is so cool i mean i'm gonna get to check out like new brookmeyer before anybody else sees or hears it not a chance i got to know the fedex guy who was coming to my house every day with more pages like by his first name and it was just like because brookmeyer was always behind and okay. the thing is, he loved to say it this way, which I think is just awesome. He would say, the muse sleeps late in this house, <laughs> which meant that the burden was always on the copyist. And so sure. I had two guys that were kind of round the clock proofreading basically every page that I was hand copying of this four movement suite for Clark Terry. Sure. And now, let me let me ask you a quick question. Now, copying is... I guess there's still are there still copyists in any capacity or because everything's on the computer now you write the score and you can print out the parts on on their own but it's sort of a it's a little bit of a of a um a lost art because of the technology or whatever but I feel like I hear from a lot of composers who got their start in copying and it has to be I'm, I suppose I, I'd be interested to know a little bit about just the process in that and what doing that work was like because I imagine in one regard you're able to absorb some of the music or check out the the voicings as you go but probably in another regard too you're just trying to get everything done as quickly as you can what, what was involved in that just as like sort of a brief so to give the understanding to the people who in the distant future may have no idea yeah no it's, it's a really good question and i like talking about those days because it was so different and um and so to start from where you asked first and go backwards yes mm-hmm. there are still there is still some work for copyists, but what it tends to be now is more formatting and fixing things and making them look good. Like I, I seem to know that there's some, like Jim McNeely, he writes probably sketches on paper maybe, but he writes into Finale or whichever program, but then he has somebody make it look good and make the parts, but he makes the score. But that's kind of the exception. Maria Schneider actually still writes on paper. So she hires a copyist, to put it into the machine. Like she, wow. I don't even know that 
that last I knew at least, she didn't even know how to operate Finale Sibelius. That's not part of what she, she writes on paper. And so there are a few people, I think, in that way. I mean, I still write all of my scores longhand on King Brand paper with good wow. pencils. I've got an addiction to good pencils and good lead. And, uh, but uh -huh. then I put it into Finale generally. Unless I'm on such a tight deadline, then I find, try to find a copyist who can at least do note entry for me while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, all the things, you know, there was just like the gear, the gear heads with any instru instrument that people would play, like what mouthpiece you use and what kind of this, what kind of, what serial number. I mean, as copyists, we had our own, our own nerd out, like, oh, what pen are you using? Yeah. Oh, you're using, oh, you're using a Pelican? Oh, uh, uh, with what nib? Oh, you're using a Z08? Oh, yeah. No, no, I, I use the Z1.0. But, you know, and then which paper are you using King or using Aztec or you, this, what ink? I used to mix my own ink from the book, oh, wow. uh, Clint Romer's book, The Art of Music Copying. That's still a famous book for hand copying. And so he had in there a formula to mix your own ink, like this much Higgins engrossing ink with this much whatever the other thing was. So I'd mix my own ink. And um, so it was a whole, a whole world of, of that. And different pens and trying different pens sometimes. And, and so the phone would ring, but basically no pretty much no writers copied their own music. And okay. I, I read an interesting, I can't remember the composer, is it Robert Starling? Something like that. I read his autobiography years ago, classical composer, who said that, at least he was one who said that you, it was seen as kind of that you were a lesser composer if you had to do that, like you weren't making enough money. So somehow you'd skimp on daily like eating in order to hire a copyist because ooh you wouldn't ever want to copy your own music sure and so it was quite quite the lucrative business and so i mean the, even with um, the musicians union there was a separate copyist union and everything was laid out with like you know if you put clefts on every line that was an extra 15 cents or whatever the whole thing was that went up gradually over the years and if you had to you know that's why people worked in transpose scores because if it was a concert score the copyist charged double to copy your parts oh, wow. because they had to, so that's kind of how the the transpose score thing became the thing i mean i still work in concert because i prefer that way but i always pretty much copied my own music so i didn't have the worry of of uh, the cost being double but and then for example like string parts if obviously there's lots of violin ones, you'd make one violin one part and then photocopy, but you got paid extra for the fact that that part was going to be duplicated for the rest of the string section. Double stave parts for piano or any, or harp or whatever, you got paid double for per page for those. So, you know, when you think back about it, like to copy, let's say in the, in the 90s, 1990s, I guess, to copy a big band chart, that was 300 bars, it might be $1,500 back then. Wow. So a significant cost for, you know, even Brookmeyer, again, being kind of funny, salty, but, he, you know, he used to say, like, oh, the commission pays the copyist. Basically, like, whatever he got paid to write the chart mostly goes to get the parts made, you know? So. Sure, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. It seems like a great way to make a living in the time being, you know, while you're composing yourself and working on new things. Did you get a chance to, to then... Did you feel like you were absorbing the music in some respect, or was most of it a technical exercise? No, it's it's interesting you ask that question because uh, you know the osmosis thing. I've I've noticed now from a lot of people that don't know things. That I'm like, wow, I'm kind of so writers that are good writers. Like, oh, I'm kind of surprised you would ask that question in a way because, like, that's just something that almost like an author who does a lot of reading kind of learns by the reading. And there's a lot of people that say like. Brookmeyer, but others, plenty of people would say, you, like Bob's specific example was like, if I want to learn one of the Elliott Carter string quartets and understand that, I would copy that out from the Elliott Carter score, but I'd do it with my own hand because that's how I don't learn it by looking at it. Same thing when we talk about transcribing versus like, oh, I played it out of the Tommy Harrell transcription book. Like, right. Yeah, no. Like, you got to sure. take that, you have to earn that. And mm -hmm. so to write it out, we internalize that, but we really learn something. And the same thing happened. I learned so much that I didn't even realize I was learning by copying from all these really good, even Don Hunsberger and how even you write 
the mute indications or to the mute and then the parentheses of when you have the mute in all these things that you don't necessarily I don't even necessarily know where I learned some of these things but it had to be from copying so it's interesting that uh, there's a guy I know that I've always, I don't know if you know the Bob Grettinger, any of the Bob Grettinger music that he wrote for Stan Kenton, that's still today so avant-garde that it, it, you can't imagine that it was written in like the ninth, end of the 40s and early 50s, like City of Glass. Mm -hmm. And so sure. I've always, like one of my desert island, or not desert island, what do you call that? Like one of the things I've looked for my whole life is scores to City of Glass. Mm -hmm. And this guy has those. I think nobody has the original Grettinger scores, but somebody from the original parts made scores. So now I have those in my possession, photocopies of that. But mm -hmm. the exchange was, he asked me if I would, from the parts, make a score to Incident in Jazz, another Grettinger piece from that time period. And so I've been doing that. I'm almost done with it now. I'm just in the proofreading, making sure that everything's cool. And I realized again the same thing that I've learned over and over that, man, seeing what Grettinger wrote as far as like indications, and it's like, wow, it still is that by copying somebody else's music, you learn so many subtle things and it makes your own music better. So I feel like it's, it's important to do that. And even if you're not getting paid as a copyist, I feel like, and even if the score exists, then if there's, especially at least if there's even a section of somebody's score that you, that really grabs you, score that out. I mean, write that out yourself to make the marks on the paper to really see what that is and learn what that is. So I hope that answered the question, but sure. I just, again, I'm like, man, I'm going to keep telling my students again, copy out other people's work. Cause I'm again, from this Grettinger thing, I'm like, man, wow. Sure. Now, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but it reminds me um, as well of one of the things that I thought was really interesting in the book is uh, Brookmeyer talking about writing everything by pencil or still using the pencil. And I, I, I really like that tactile approach of it's almost you're absorbing the music through your, you know, writing it out as opposed to, I don't know, I might just be a Luddite in some respect, but, but having to go through and write the stuff out by pencil, I, I always think that's interesting. So you're still doing that. You're still do everything by pencil. I do, yeah, and I feel like, and for the uh, with my students at Eastman, I make them. We do the first three exercises: the white note exercise, the uh, chromatic major seventh, the chromatic fourth exercise, and then the harmonic exercise. And I have them do those. I insist they do all of those in pencil on paper, because mm. you know it also lines up with Stravinsky. Stravinsky talked about the tactile sense and making the mark on the paper, kind of the mind's ear, the arm the actual physical connection. And I think too that, you know, Bob also talked about that there's a different, and I believe this too, there's a different commitment of when you put that mark on the paper. When you put it into the machine, for me it's like, you know, I mean, we're all used to as writers, like not sleeping for a few days, making a deadline where like, you know, it's kind of the coolest thing sometimes, you know, there's like weird things you think you're seeing out the side <laughs> yeah. of your peripheral vision. And you know, we've all been there doing that. And so once in a while I think that like, I see, the, I see the notes on the finale screen, I mean, on my computer screen, but they're there, but they're not really there. And I can't touch them, but they're there. And then, you know, it just kind of gets to be this weird mind thing. Sure. But when it's on paper, I can erase that. I can, you know, there's a mark there. The other thing, too, is that, you know, when we erase those on real paper, there's still an indentation that you can go back and maybe see that, you know, what I had there before was better. And if you're super organized, maybe in the computer, you can have version all these different, you know, minute versions of as you were working on the piece. But really, can you go back to finding like that thing I had there the third time was the note that really I think was bet like how are you going to find that? Or like a great example with I'm sure, you know, Ryan Truesdell and the Gil Evans project mm -hmm. with Ryan, you know, I co-produced the live record and Ryan and I have been friends forever. And okay. seeing some of those scans that he did of Gill's original manuscript, is, they're so detailed that you could see where Gill erased the note. Because the crazy thing, maybe people know this now, but Ryan figured out that when Gill rewrote some of his arrangements for the Apollo Theater gig, he erased the original ones. And he wrote, like he saved the paper. I don't know if he just was didn't want to take out trees or if he just 
you know, it just didn't have more paper. But he erased what he had written for like the Great Jazz Standards record or, you know, Old Bottle New Wine and used the same paper for the different instrumentation for the Apollo Theater. Ryan could actually go and see what note was written before on, on these scans. So pretty pretty cool and that's funny that is cool. yeah, <laughs> like i say you know we have the beethoven things we have all this stuff in the libraries mozart's hand i mean eastman has a page from debussy i think a real mm. one i think what is going to be what's going to be in libraries and museums like there's no original like is it the first one that came out of the printer because nobody's sure. actually like we're losing something and it seems like nobody's really talking about that but i feel yeah. like man you know it's 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 an, interesting, it's an interesting point. It's the same thing I feel like with letters. I mean, this is a side note, but, you know, we have letters to people all the time now. What are we going to do? Go in, in the future and break into their email accounts and see what they're writing <laughs> right. to each other? <laughs> There's something sort of mystical about that physical piece. of This was his handwriting. Look, this is what he, you know. Yeah, and you could tell something by that. I mean, or you look at Beethoven's handwriting, is you know, it's like, oh, he was tortured. Or even all the, you know, handwriting analysis people for a while, there were all those books that was the rage. Like, you could tell a lot about a person by their handwriting. But I think... You know, interesting to see everybody's different manuscript. You know, I mean, I have a couple scores of Clara Fisher's and, you know, they're very specific. And you have like, you know, sometimes, I mean, Brookmeyer, because the muse slept late in his house, would, you know, write fast then when, at some points. And sometimes I'd call him up with questions. I'm like, Bob, I don't know, is that a D, an E, or an F? Like, it was such a big, <laughs> like, I had no idea, like, what note that was. <laughs> sure. So, so you you went from then copying to studying with him? Yes, and the the way that uh, that happened is while I was copying that first project for the Clark Terry 75th birthday, I said, oh, you know, I'd really love to come take a lesson with you. And he said, oh, great. So he said, we'll figure that out. And so the way I always tell the story is finally project was done. He said, yeah, so uh, let's uh, let's figure out a date and, you know, bring some of your stuff and you know, you come here to New Hampshire and, you know, um, you can, I'll decide if, you know, if I want to work with you and you can decide if you want to work with me. <laughs> I thought, well, half of this equation is figured out. So <laughs> what's going to happen if he's like, ah, no, sorry, kid, I'm kind of good. <laughs> and thankfully sure, right. that didn't happen. And so the first lesson though, because Bob and I didn't know each other at that point, like had never actually met in person. Mm -hmm. Then uh, after every lesson after that, I stayed in the house and we you know, it'd usually be three or four days that I was there. And his wife, Jan, who's amazing, she would cook food and we would just have listen to music late at night and have lessons. And But the first lesson, I flew to New Hampshire. Bob picked me up in his red Camaro and it was great. He was just speeding, you know, down the, the highway. And I think that if I remember right, they call the police constables in in. New Hampshire, and he's like, and so he's just, he's going like 85, 90 miles an hour, and like, we pass one, he's like, ah, come get me, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm sober, I don't have any underage girls in the back, like all these things that he's just yelling out, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I'm just this kid, he's like, who is this guy? So yeah. we get back there, we had a four-hour lesson, four-hour lesson, which is amazing, wow. and then he took me yeah. back to the airport, but it was winter, and a huge snowstorm happened, and so... I did get back to Rochester, but it was like a 23-hour day Ooh. from when I left to when I got back. So I call it cement head kind of, and so I got back. I got back, and the the next day I woke up, and I thought, wow, I had the craziest dream. <laughs> I dreamt that Brookmeyer picked me up in his Camaro, and I had a lesson. I was like, wait a minute. I opened up my notebook, and there was, in his handwriting that you can see in my book, the white note exercise. Wow, it actually happened. And then I started to work on the white note exercise, and I thought, wow, I had my master's degree with Ray Wright at Eastman already at this point, and had written a fair amount of music, and I thought, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> like, this is the stupidest thing anybody... I've got, like, one octave over a C pedal or C sus, and eventually, of course, started to move forward, and I, you know, I pushed through the walls, and it's, you know, now I teach all my students that exercise, but... Sure. And I expect that they might have that experience of like, wait, I'm supposed to try to create with this now? So Yeah. Now, do a quick overview, if you would, about what what is the white note exercise for everybody listening? Because it's, it's fascinating. Many of these little exercises to get you out of the 
out of your sort of box or whatever. It's really great. Yeah. Uh, the white note exercise is the first one that he did with everyone. And he did it a little bit differently depending. Sometimes it was just over a C pedal in the left hand of the piano. And in my case, it was C sus, so C, F, and G in the left hand. And every time that kind of dies out, you just re-strike it. So when you do the exercise, you just do it single staff, treble clef. And you have from middle C to third space C. And that's it, and no chromatic notes. And you just write melodies, and you just try to get good flow, remembering that we all overwrite. So remembering to put rests are as important as notes. And try to create is through compose, so there's no repeats, there's no, we're not trying to make an AABA or any kind of form, but we want it to hang together. So if you're kind of looking intervallically, there's a lot you can do even within one octave. And so it's amazing, you know, I've I tell people, and it's absolutely true, and still for myself, I still do them. Brookmeyer, 80 years old, when he was rusty, he was still doing white note exercises. So it just it will help you write better melodies the rest of your life. The other mm. thing that's great that I talk about, and you know, there might be other people, I've taken a lot of composition lessons, but with a lot of different people, but I never encountered anybody talking about two things about composition. One is the warming up to write. You know, we would never play our instrument without warming up, either playing long tones or whatever we do to kind of, or even scales or, but somehow we don't think about that as writers. We sit down, we're, we're cold, it's either happening or it doesn't happen, we're frustrated or we're happy, but we didn't warm up. And, and really, what is the warming up? It's warming up our mind and body that we're going to work now, as much as it is like getting our instrument warm. And, and so Bob was the first one who was talking about warming up to write every day. And that's another hmm. place where the white note exercise is really invaluable because you don't even have to write that down. You can just sit at the piano, write it down. You can sit at the piano and play a little bit of white note stuff and just kind of get, maybe you'll find something that you will scribble down, but you're just getting, this like the warm up for writing. Sure. And uh, go ahead. Sorry. Do you still, do you still do, do you still warm up before you write? Yes. I do. What are some of the, so, so there's the white note exercise. What are some other uh, little things that you'll do just to get yourself in the mindset and prepare yourself? Sometimes I just improvise a little bit, which is actually how the white note exercise for Bob came about. He said that, I don't remember if this is in my book, this story, but he, he talked about that the white note exercise was a piano exercise for him before it was a composition exercise. And he said one time he played for an hour straight that he, ne he didn't record in any fashion, but, and he felt like that was the closest he got to pure music. He was just lost in white note, not just one octave, but, you know, playing on the piano with all, only white notes. And mm -hmm. so that's what really made him think of the exercise compositionally. But so I do that and just, that's mostly what I do to warm up. Or sometimes, you know, there's, there's a power of one note, which... I don't remember if, uh, I think in, in my Artist Share project, I do have the 1987 Brookmeyer lecture that is streamable. And that still, that was before I met Bob. And I found that in Ray Wright's office at Eastman. And I copied that. And then I actually transcribed the talking of Brookmeyer from that lecture. And it still inspires me, you know, the, what he has to say and, and getting to work and all these things. And in there, he does his interval, he plays through the intervals and talks about them, but he talks about the power of one note. And if we, it's hard to find a quiet space, but on a good piano in a quiet space, if you just play middle C and just hold that down and listen to how long that note is actually going to sound and with the harmonics that are in there. And so there's a, a there can be a, a warming up kind of centering quality, even about just playing one pitch. So occasionally... I'll do that. Okay. And uh, I, I know in uh, Stockhausen talked about, I think he lived in a castle so he could actually do this, but he heard no sound, <laughs> nothing. He created none and there was no musical sound for like a whole week and then he played whatever one note on the piano and it was like this whole world. Like I wish I could experience that feeling. Sure, yeah, you're going to make it to a castle or something. <laughs> right. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... Let me see. I want to try to get into some of these exercises and, and the book a little bit. Uh, let me ask you this before we do, before we get into it briefly, what, what inspired you to write this in the first place or to go to interview him about these exercises? Did you just want to try to capture this, this knowledge when you could? Yeah. 
Yeah, I felt like there was, you know, nobody was really writing about Bob, and I, this is the first book, and Jan Brookmeyer, partly other people had suggested things, but she had said, no, Dave's book, I want it to be first, because Ryan and I, Truesdale again, we would both go mm -hmm. up there sometimes to the house and hang out with Bob and Jan, and take lessons, eat food, and so, you know, the, and then that was over many years, and so I think even uh, Jan's quote on the back of the book says something about the presence being in the house, you know, for, for a lot of, a lot of the time. And so, so I had thought about it and I, you know, I figured that I'm not like, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be my forte to write a biography about somebody, even Brookmeyer. And so I thought, but this, I, I was always, some of my favorite books that I own are Ligeti and Conversation, Conversations with Ludoslavsky. There's a Messian one. There's a Nadia Boulanger one. There's a lot of in-conversation books. And I love those because there's a question and then there's a response. And so I thought, well, that attracted me to doing that with Bob. And I know that the Conversations with Ludoslavsky was one of Brookmeyer's favorite books also. And so I thought, mm. okay. So, and that's why some of my questions are not necessarily jazz-oriented, but I kind of went back through all of those books of mine that are my favorites and kind of crafted questions from the way they were asking, the author was asking those composers. And I just wanted to document all of this about Bob because, you know, he was so good to me. I mean, I tell the story often that when I've said that some people think that he was kind of, you know, gruff and mean, and he could be, but one of the greatest stories I have is, so I was copying for him then and taking lessons, and, you know, we would talk every once in a while if I wasn't working for him. And we happened to be talking in, in our first house. The furnace had blown out, like had to be replaced, big money. And I, he said, what's going on? And I told him that just because that's what was going on. And he said, oh, yeah, that happened in my house in Goshen, New York. That's a drag. How much is it going to cost to? I said, well, it's like. 2000 or something. He's like, okay, Jan and I, we're going to FedEx you the money overnight. We'll send you a check tomorrow. Get the furnace because it's a drag to be cold. And then you can work it off in copy work. Like, this is Bob Brookmeyer. And I found out since that he did that with other people that were like trying to buy a house or something. Like, well, you know, give you a little boost here and just, you know, pay it back. It's like, wow, jazz legend guy. And that's how he was. So, you know, oh, and I never paid for one lesson. You know, his rate, he knew I couldn't really pay his rate. So we were bartering for copy work, which is perfect for me. Except that for sure. like the first 10 years or something, he was like, yeah, I need you. But this is getting paid for by Danish radio. So this isn't part of our barter. Okay. And then this is getting paid for by, you know, Swiss whatever. So it's not part of our, so I was always getting paid for the project. So when I did his 80th birthday concert at Eastman, that was one small way of me paying him back because the world wasn't paying attention to him turning 80. So we brought him in. I've got the great picture that's up on the internet, a little blurry, of him blowing out the cake at Eastman. But we did the 80th and did a retrospective, and he played that night. And I commissioned with no money. Uh, uh, whatever people, composers that I asked, wanted to do uh, to happy birthday in one minute. Although nobody's was quite a minute. And McNeely's, Jim McNeely's was three movements and it was like two minutes. But it was three quick movements. It's it's awesome. So it was Jim McNeely, mm -hmm. John Hollenbeck, Bill Holman, Ryan Truesdale, and myself. And then I asked Maria Schneider, but she had other projects going on because I would have loved one from her too. And we I interspersed those between the retrospective of of uh, Bob's music. So that was a small way of me giving back because he, he never took a dime for any of the lessons so wow that's amazing he seemed to really have a just a, a love for it and a passion for for giving that information or like getting the information to the to the next generation yeah and i think so to come back around to your question so i feel like because he did and he loved teaching i wanted all of this to be available for people and to be out into the world so i did it sure. for that reason i I've said before that it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to write a book and make lots of money or something. It was just about he gave me so much. I want the world to be able to have this information, these exercises, his way of thinking that I hadn't encountered from, you know, nobody says the first solo should only happen when nothing else can. And all these like the quotes even like 
Some people yeah. have said the quotes in the back of the book that I put in there, like that's worth the, that's like the gold of the book. If <laughs> so, yeah, right. Yeah, and, and going through this again, I, I'm going through looking at all the all the marks that I made the first time I read it, underlying all these quotes. And there's really a ton of value in just his him and his own voice, and anybody in their own voice. But there's, I certainly think that your work as an artist, as a composer, as an improviser, as a musician in any capacity, is a reflection on your personality. So to have that, it's 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 an oral art in its own sense. Like this is what he's thinking about, and I can think of a couple of quotes that just you couldn't write it in a biography and you wouldn't be able to recreate it as a method book or something like that. But one that comes to mind is um, you asked him, I think, uh, how he handles uh, dissonance vertically and horizontally. And he said, fearlessly. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that. I think there's so much good stuff in there that's just like, man, it's, it's almost an attitude as much as it is a methodology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. One of the things that I've really found striking about this, and it's, it's kind of an interesting... Um, I would say, dichotomy in thinking about music or art in general, is I feel like the, the average person has this idea of a composer as somebody who's just suddenly struck with these I ideas and is going to write it down or has some sort of innate, is just going to pull the music from the ether or whatever. And even composers will sometimes speak of it in those terms, like um, Stravinsky talking about, he said, uh, I was the vessel through which the rite of spring came or something mm -hmm. like that it's this idea that like sometimes and sometimes you do sit down and write and it's like well there it is it's you know it's it's fully formed but one of the things i find so fascinating about all of the um the descriptions of sort of methods in the book is how uh let's say it's it's really work it seems like he came at it i'm not sure if if he thought about it in sort of a romantic sense in that okay i'm pulling this information from the ether but just the idea of, okay, your job is to, is to fill up pages of music, or I'm going to work with these, with these cells or these, little, these notes or these intervals and just try to create and create and create. It's a very uh, craftsman work kind of approach to, to composition. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about his, his, his philosophy on that, or maybe the balance between that s spontaneous art and the nature of really working to try to come up with as many different ideas as you could. Sure. Yeah, it's very well said the way he said it. He was very much that way like Stravinsky with every day you go to work and he would talk about that Stravinsky, I think it was four hours every day where Stravinsky sat down and worked and supposedly if he didn't have any ideas come to him, he'd write his name forward and backward, but it was again the tactile, like sitting there being in the moment of, of working. And Bob used to talk about that, yeah, you just, the thing was you went to work and even like Stravinsky said, or I guess, no, it's a, it's a Picasso quote, I think that said, he said, that inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Hmm. And that lines up with Stravinsky too, and certainly with how Bob thought about things. And, you know, he would say that there you are working, and once in a while, I don't remember if he called it the gold fairy, called her the gold fairy, would come across your writing desk and sprinkle a little bit of gold dust or magic, but other than that, it was just there. You, pencil and paper, kind of naked in the woods, trying to make something happen, and eventually something will happen, but you have to put in the time. It's not going to happen ever, really, if you don't. I mean, once in a while you wake up with an idea, but then you have that little bit, and then what? Then it's the hard work of turning that into whatever it's going to be. So that was, yeah, he was very much about the being dedicated. He talked about writing time being sacred time, that you carve out whatever that is in our busy days, but there's that amount of time that nothing can kind of take that time away. Whatever time you decide that is, it's got to be that and to stick to that. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to say that I can do that, but be, as we know, with teaching and all these other things, and but I still try to spend some time every day at least thinking about what I'm working on, if not actually mm -hmm. sitting down and working on it. But he was really kind of, you know, really felt that if you could carve out that hour a day or whatever it is, or even if it's 20 minutes a day, but that nothing interrupts that, you'd be better off. Sure. I wonder if you could go over, I mean, there's a wealth of knowledge in here. And uh, I think it's, it's, 
it's sort of essential reading for jazz composers because of the possibilities in just these little exercises. But I wonder if you could give maybe one or two more examples of just little exercises that he would do to try to get himself out of the his, or or it would say, suggest to you, let's say, to get you out of your mindset and maybe how you might use some of these things in, as a composer. Sure. So the uh, the white note, the other the, to finish one more thought with that is that so I'd had the first lesson. <clears throat> with Bob, and then as I said, came home and tried to do the white note exercise at first. And I knew uh, the Stockholm Jazz Orchestra record dreams of Bob's before I had the lesson. And as I started working on my white note, I realized, wow, Ceremony, his piece Ceremony, which is one of my favorite pieces, it's totally a white note exercise. So the next time I talked to him, I said, did that start out as a white note exercise? They said, yeah, it did. And so that piece still to me is one of my favorite. Brookmeyer, it's so beautiful in the fact that, you know, there's only the one section where the organ is playing, which it's amazing, even the harmony that he creates that's diatonic in that section, but there's B flats, so it's kind of in F there, but otherwise it's just beautifully in C. And so hmm. that one is, yeah, that's a, they're all special, I guess. Then the second one being the chromatic force of the chromatic major seven. So each of those, the right hand, which I'll explain, but the right hand parameters stay the same, but the chromatic major seventh, so the left hand is just major sevenths that goes down uh, in half steps, in half notes, and then back up. That would be one time through the exercise. In the case of the perfect fourth, it's perfect fourth starting on, usually we do it up an octave because otherwise it gets too muddy mm -hmm. so cf and b flat and then that goes down the same way in half steps in half notes and then back up and in the right hand it's all eighth notes and you can't duplicate whatever is sounding at that moment in the left hand as far as pitch and so what that teaches you is to stretch your ears and to find what i call the good wrong notes so then chromaticism as Bob put it, could become fearless. And one of the greatest things, I had a, a student who is a guitar, jazz guitar player, but also getting his uh, uh, med degree, so to be a doctor. And I had, when he did that exercise for me, he came back the next week and he said, you know, my favorite composer is Thelonious Monk. And I listen to Monk all the time, wherever I am and in the car, and I have done this for years. And after working on this chromatic exercise, I heard stuff in Monk that I've not heard, and I've listened to all of these pieces over and over again. So I was like, oh, that's just another clue that that works. But as far as writing, mm -hmm. it gives you the belief that there are no, really, there are no wrong notes. Bob used to say, only notes wrongly written or wrongly played. So, Sure. So yeah. that one is great, and that just, I still do that. Sometimes, again, at this point, I don't necessarily write these things out. I'll just do that and just enjoy the dissonance and the rub. And then you realize in doing that exercise, too, that tension and release is functioning on a different level. Because we have now in that, because we're looking for the dissonance, there's tension and release on a highly dissonant level instead of tension and release in the way we normally know it as a five to a one or, so there's still a level of tension and release that's going on. It's just almost, you know, a notch or two up from, so looking at like, okay, if I have a D flat against this, the C and the B, and then I move to this note, am I getting more tension or less tension? And how do I, so that's how I kind of use that one now. And then uh, the third one of the, three pitch harmonic moving that uh, three pitch harmonic exercise what he did was he would just scribble scribble out he would write out in certain measures arrival points which became simultaneous departure points so a three pitch structure and you from maybe he put that in bar nine so from bar one to bar nine it's all you making these three pitch structures and when you get to bar nine his has to sound like it's an arrival, and then that becomes the departure to maybe bar 13, where he gives you this other sonority to... And so what that does, that's, again, tension and release, but now in a harmonic function. So that pulls mm -hmm. you, takes you away from the 2-5-1 
kind of thing in functional harmony that it's good that we know that, but that can become so hard for so many writers to break out of. So if they want to, nobody has to, of course, it's not a rule, sure, right. but if yeah, you, yeah, yeah. if you want to, a lot of people are like, how do you, how do you get away from that? And so that exercise uh, will help with that. So sometimes too, I'll just improvise again, just three note structures. And I feel that each of these uh, that I show in my book project in the, uh, I think it's the fifth lesson, if you do the composer participant, the higher level thing, you get the five streaming audio lessons with me. And I think in the fifth one, I talk about where I believe, I never talked to Bob specifically about these things, but where I believe that these exercises have kind of shown up in his work, and then I give examples. And so, of course, uh, ceremony is the white note example, and also mm -hmm. remembering, which is the third movement of the celebration suite with Scott Robinson. That's a white note. There are a few other ones. And Happy Song is one of them from uh, Spirit Music. And then the chromatic, there's especially the, the moment in his KP94 that was his, he reconstructed King Porter Stomp so much that it became an original composition. <laughs> so took it apart so much and put it back together in a new way, which that's one of my favorite pieces mm. of Bob's. But there's that chromatic synth piano line and you know he said in the book no nah, i wasn't thinking about the chromatic exercise because i asked him but still those things once you do these they're in your brain they're in you as kind of a, a thing that might come out when you're just working creatively sure. and then song sing sung where he's moving chromatically in and out of uh, you know, kind of inside, outside, and I feel like there's chromatic stuff going on in that one. And then the one of the things with the three-pitch harmonic exercise, which I haven't, I still have on my list to do, but he said, you know, then you can do this in four and five and six notes, so I can't even imagine, like, if you're moving all of that would be pretty heavy-duty oh, stuff. Sure. But I yeah. think that his piece dreams, whether he was thinking about it or not, and, you know, I put that in the project, and, you know, there's traditional, you know, there's half diminished chords and you can analyze it kind of pretty much in a jazz way. But I feel like he wasn't thinking that way. He was thinking tension and release from sonority to sonority. So that's where I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, a few things of these exercises have shown up in his own work. What I don't know is if he wrote the piece and then made the exercise out of that or if he made the exercise and the piece kind of came out of, I don't know, which the sure. horse in the cart, you know, which one was first, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then to what degree it's, you know, just floating, those sounds then floating around in your head or becomes an organic part of your own artistic personality. Exactly. It, it seems as though all of these, um, all these exercises really do a great job of getting you outside of your comfort zone and trying new things. I feel like as jazz composers, we start off learning to improvise over 32 bar AABA -A tunes and 12 bar blues and, and two five ones in these structures, and then it can be easy to fall into the habits of saying like, well, let me just take this form and I'll just come up with something, or oh, well, the form has to be such and such and it has to be four bars, or the harmony has to be this and that, but th these are all ways of just saying, okay, that's, but that's not the, there's no, there's nobody, there's no rules, there's nobody saying we have to do that, like what are the other possibilities? Um, there was one quote I found that I thought was amazing. Uh, let me see if I can remember where it is. Oh yeah, uh, about one. Of, I think it was about the experimental song exercise. This is designed to get you out of your world and into a world that is cold and unforgiving. <laughs> That's another one I like. It's just the idea that, like, well, we can't rely on these, these, uh, you know, these. Let's say we can't use these musical principles as a crutch. We have to try to find our own way, and you know, whatever comes out. Uh, how do you, as a composer, think about form? Um, that's a good question, and it was a difficult thing for me to, to you know, coming up as a ex-chess trumpet player, as I call it now, but, you know, I, I went to a, basically a bebop undergraduate school playing jazz trumpet and writing, but so to get out of the AABA and the standard forms, and it was, I think maybe for me, even more of a struggle than, than getting out of two and four bar phrases and getting out of two, five, one harmony. So form was kind of the, the more daunting of the subjects in a way. 
and it's interesting, I, you know, I got to spend, I've, I've had the opportunity to spend a, a fair amount of time with Phil Holman as well. And the very last Arrangers holiday, Ray Wright was ill, and so it was Manny Album and Bill Holman. And in that Arrangers holiday, one of the students asked Bill Holman, and I don't know if you've spent any time with Bill Holman, but, you know, he's, he's a man of few words, and there's a lot of pause, and, and he's also very dry and hysterical. And so a student asked him in, in the Arrangers Holiday Workshop, so how do you approach form? And there was a pause, as there often is, and he said, with much fear and trepidation. <laughs> <laughs> and in that That's moment, I have never forgotten that quote, that what he had to say. And so uh, for me, there was an interesting thing. There's a series of books uh, that are not only about music, but it's the, the Poetics of Music Stravinsky. It's the Harvard series that, you know, they would invite guests in. I think there's the Bernstein one, uh, Roger Sessions did one, Copeland did one. And in the Roger Sessions book, he, can, he talked about form as association. And that was kind of life-changing for me in my work. Because it, out of just that one statement, what it meant to me is that, it means to me, is that as long as I reference something that has happened before, whenever I do that, whenever I feel as the creator of the work, that, that, that that's necessary. Like I might be losing you as the listener or losing me as the creator. I reference something that's happened in the past, and that in itself freed me up to be able to not be so concerned about is it, where's the A, where's the, so that's kind of how I approach it is, I, it, it's from an organic point of view, and you know, I mean, there's things come back, and it's not necessarily through composed, my work is not really through composed, although I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to that, and if it, the piece seemed to want that, then I would do that, but I still feel like there should be a reference to things that have happened in in the piece, and so that's kind of the guiding factor for me as far as form. Okay, if that made sense. Interesting. Yep. Sure. And I, one of the things that I've I've noticed. Um, so your record, uh, Facing the Mirror, uh, that came out in two thousand nine, mm -hmm. right? And it's a beautiful record. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of great Thank compositions on there. Uh, it's been really interesting checking it out, and uh, one of the things that I noticed that you do that a lot of um, that a lot of the people that studied with Bob Brookmeyer, I think, have a great way of doing is to really use the material. Is not just oh, here's something, and then let's go on to the next thing, or here's an idea, and we're out of it. It's like what what are the what are the different ways that we can uh, take advantage of this idea and push it to? I, I had a, um, a friend of mine, a former teacher, David Schumacher, studied with Brookmeyer at NEC. And he would talk about taking the music to the breaking point mm -hmm. and take it like use the music as much as you can before it makes sense to, to move on. Yeah. How, how do you th how do you think about that? Do you is there a point where is there a is there an approach that you have or is it a very organic whatever you can do to take this music and make it whatever it is? It's a good question. And I think it's it, 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 depending on the situation, of course, it could be either. But. The, my early lessons with Bob, he kept saying more, like stay with the idea. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I, do, I talk about this. So in my, I guess some of the pieces that we were playing with my Dave Ravello ensemble every week when I was doing Monday nights and then I started doing Thursday nights and, you know, we could talk about the band too. But, you know, we were mm -hmm. in some of those earlier pieces, even before the Facing the Mirror pieces that I worked with Bob, then, you know, I would bring them to him and he would say, ah, more, more, more. And so I would take the, the idea because I trusted him and I would stretch that to the point where I felt like ah, it's, it's too much, you know. And so I, I maybe would scale it back, but it was more than I would have done. And I left it where I was uncomfortable, like that it was too much trying to stretch myself. Mm -hmm. And then when, after a while, we'd go back, I'd maybe call some of those older pieces on the gig, and I'm like, what was I worried about? Man, this could have gone way longer. So finally, I did stretch my own. Now I tell other people, you know, it, 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 we, I think as writers tend to, we, get, we think that we're going to bore somebody, because maybe we're bored. Like, we've been working on these two bars for so long that we've just going to go on to something else. But realizing that it goes by in split second to whoever is listening, you know, sometimes they say, like, you give me something that I want to hear more of and I reach for it, 
and it's gone already. And you've been living with it, but I haven't as a listener. So staying mm. with this, like, give me a chance to actually live in that before you give me something else is the way I think about it. But yeah, Bob also, he kind of had, sometimes he had that put it in your face and really keep it right there. Like he used to do this thing where staying with one idea and, and the listener is getting like, oh, really wish you'd do something else. Kind of, kind of okay with this now. Like I've, I got the point, like, hmm, still going on. Really wish something else would happen now. You know, and he would just build this up and saying, yeah, but you have the listener. Because then when ever you give them anything else, they're with you and they go that direction with you because you've kept them kind of so there's a way to do that he used to always do mm, a thing with sure. like you're going through red caution lights you know like i should probably do something different go through that caution light next caution light now there's a red light he told it much better but and so now the police are following you and you're like still staying with that idea basically and then you hang a quick right change it finally but you know he would build it all up but he felt like that we all tend to fear being boring. He used to sometimes say, being boring is good. It's okay. Being mm -hmm. boring is good. So <laughs> Interesting. Now, let me ask you this. This is for my own personal benefit here. As you're working on a piece, it's true that you could spend, let's say one could spend, I mean, an hour on two bars of music or something like that. I mean, sometimes it's just a grind. It reminds me a little bit of like Michelangelo talking about getting the David out of the marbles, you know, out of the, you know, marble from the quarry or whatever, where it's like you're trying to find this figure in the music or whatever. Is there anything that you do to just keep it, keep it sort of fresh in your mind or not get bored of your own music as you go or not get bogged down? Because sometimes it feels like, you know, you, you you just want to get away from that two bars because the amount of time you spent on it. But as a listener in the moment when it's finally played, it may only be just a quick moment that you'd want to kind of stick on. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question and a hard one to answer because sometimes I'm able to just, uh, you know, realize that I'm going to leave that. I might go back a year or two years from now, maybe change that then. But it's it's there's nothing wrong with it the way it is <laughs> like it's not going to be an embarrassing moment so i'm going to go forward and maybe sometimes by going forward and leaving it even if i'm not that's completely satisfied with that the way those two measures are let's say in this case there might be something mm -hmm. that i discover as i'm creating the rest of the piece that answers and i can go back but if i stay fixated on that i'm never going to go forward or i'm maybe never mm -hmm. going to finish the piece so it's kind sure. of a, you know what, I'm just going to hope that stays quiet for a while while I go on, and then maybe I'm going to come back and revisit that. But I try not to sure. let it get me stuck that I'm spending days every day I wake up and I come back to those same two measures and I spend eight hours on those two measures again trying to like, nah, I don't know. Yeah. But sometimes... Sure. That's a good answer. Yeah. Sometimes I've had a thing where, you know, I'll play like a, a minor second, like a, you know, D, E, flat, G kind of... And then I'm like, no, nah, I think it's D E G. No, no, it's D E flat G. Yeah. And then I go to bed that night and I wake up the next day and I'm like, no, nah, I think it's D E G. Like I've I've had those and it's like, okay, you know, it's it it matters. The small details matter, but if they if they interrupt the flow of the work, we have to kind of set them aside somehow and go forward because, like I said, the answer may be later in the piece that actually helps define what that earlier thing should be in that piece or could sure. better mm -hmm. what would be better in that situation yeah to put it into a context exactly. later on this is the kind of stuff i want the <laughs> average person to understand about the compositional process is is just those little eh, it's got to be an e flat here there's so much that like I don't know, soul and purpose that goes into even the minutia and all this stuff, you know. And then it's, you know, it's funny is you spend so much time on these pieces and then you go, oh, I hope in, you know, a year I'll play this for somebody who go by in 30 seconds or whatever. <laughs> Did you hear my E flat? And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, what I guess so. <laughs> so let me ask you about your group, the Dave Ravello Ensemble. It's kind of a small big band, but it is a uh, unique instrumentation. It is, and uh, I could talk about how I came about um, deciding on that as well, but it's three reeds, and it's, it's soprano saxophone, tenor saxophone, bass clarinet. Okay, and, wow, and it's all, is it 
Do, is it always that instrument? I mean, do they double as well? They double as well on flute and clarinet. Okay. Wow, that's... But there's that's... never alto and there's never Barry. Hmm. Which I didn't okay. realize when I put the band together and somebody else had figured out a few years later, like, wow, you have no E-flat instruments. Maybe that's why it has a little bit of the darker quality that it does, which I tend to like darker sounding music. And so did Brookmeyer, even though he used alto and Barry, but still like that sound. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, I used two trumpets who never play flugel and one flugel horn that never plays trumpet. Oh, wow. And I wrote for, you know, the idea originally was maybe I would have French horn, two trumpets and French horn. So I write for the flugel kind of like a French horn that blows forward because we play a lot of yeah. acoustic gigs and clubs. You know, the French horn is kind of built. It's got some technical. Yeah, I've, got, I've got a French horn in my group. I know the, the challenge. You totally know. <laughs> okay. You, you know what I'm saying. And then two yeah. trombones and tuba and then piano, bass, drums. And hmm. the... Um, uh, you know, there's a couple things like the tuba really came out of my love of Gil Evans's Out of the Cool is one of my favorite albums. And, you know, Gil always pretty much had a tuba in the band. Mm -hmm. And also the the kind of later George Russell band, the Living Time Orchestra from like the 80s on, didn't have sure. tuba, but kind of that smaller, large ensemble format. Also the Boston-based band Orange Then Blue. It was influential kind of in my, in my thought process of the instrumentation and also the either orchestra. Mm -hmm. So the thing for me was part of it, too, was economical having a smaller band. But even by the point in 1993, I think, when I formed the Dave Bravello Ensemble, I thought about, you know, as far as the reeds even, I thought, well, I, I like alto, but I like soprano more than alto. And bass clarinet, I've always loved bass clarinet being so mobile, and not that I don't like Barry, but I was trying to think of this kind of chamber, more chamber, it could be a chamber group, but I could also make it, hopefully at that point, I wasn't sure, sound like a big band and you wouldn't know that any voices were missing, that it wasn't a full size big band. Sure. And then with the, the other thing that goes along with the limiting yourself to have to move forward, I'd written a fair amount of music for for standard jazz orchestra and so i kind of could do my four trombone voicings in my sleep and my five reed voicings so i wanted to create a new problem for myself so three reeds and then even two trombones and tuba so i would get ready to do my trombone voicings and I'm like oh <laughs> yeah. oh wait a minute i'm gonna have to figure out how to so i partly intentionally did that to create a problem for myself to move myself forward by now i have to figure out how to do this and so it's kind of how, but yeah, Gil Evans and George Russell, those other groups, and also limiting, reducing the size so that I had to figure out how to, to create what I wanted to hear and, and couldn't rely on, well, you know, the lead alto kind of fits with the third trumpet and the first trombone, like all the standard kind of things that you learn in arranging even in college. And I was like, yeah, I, I have none of that now, so I have to figure out how to make this work in, in a good way. Sure, it's a little bit uh, put yourself out of your comfort zone in that respect. Right, and um, it's the same. I, I often say that um, limitation breeds creativity, and to say like this is what we've got, so what are we going to do with it? It gives you, it, in some ways, I think maybe uh, gives you more options because you're no longer burdened with you know endless possibilities in some respect. But mm -hmm. it's interesting that you do two trumpets and the and one flugelhorn, and that's always the the format. And is that do you find that that's a particular sound that you just that's that's a characteristic sound of your group, and that's what it's going to sound like. Like, there's no, you don't ever have an inclination to throw the other two people on on flugel or to put a third trumpet in there or anything. No, but I, I might have the two trumpets playing bucket, always the clip on bucket. I think we might have talked about this with, uh, you know, Maria Schneider and Alan Ferber mm -hmm. when I hire guys like subs to play in my band too. I'm like, you have a clip on bucket, you know, the Humesenberg. Like, oh, it's like that Joe Roll thing. That they might call that a bucket, but for me that's not a bucket. It's a, sure. it's a different sound. And yeah. so if not, I have my own set of buckets that I can bring for. But uh, so you know, I I might have the trumpets play in bucket, but just the idea trumpets only have to bring one horn. You know, flugel only brings one horn. It's kind of a pared down kind of thing. But I I uh, I've never missed having the two trumpets on flugel. Mm. And so yeah. When did you start that group? 1993. Okay. And we recorded 
Actually, the first recording that nobody's ever heard that I mixed and still like is a, definitely more, it's further outside than, uh, than the Facing the Mirror record. And that was the beginning. We went in the studio, I wrote a 45 minute suite, and then did two versions of a graphic notation free piece. That's that album. <clears throat> oh, wow. And at the time, I sent it out to a bunch of labels, and nobody was interested because a 45 minute suite meant no radio play because it was continuous. But actually, on that recording was John Hollenbeck was on drums, the Eastman students at the time, John Hollenbeck on drums, and Gary Versace on piano. Oh, wow. And so that was the beginning of it, and then so whatever the math is, I've had the band for 20-some years now. Hmm. Do, you, uh, it, do you have any plans to eventually release that recording, or do you think it'll always it'll stay forever in the vault? I, don't, I mean, I, I've thought about just releasing it digitally and just uh, would have to get the approval of some of those guys when they were much younger and don't know if they would give me their permission to actually sure. do that. But yeah um yeah and then there's i probably i've got one album that we recorded that's in the can of the band of newer material and probably you know enough other music to record one or two other recordings just from the dave Ravello ensemble and even though the only recording is from 2009 i've been writing all along so there's there's a lot more stuff sure uh, now, did you do? You did a weekly residency with that group, right? Presumably until we've gone into this bizarro lockdown land. <laughs> yeah, we stopped the residency a little before lockdown land, but um, there was. I'm not even sure when I could go back. I I don't know what made me think to do this, but I have a log that's about this thick of regular paper of every gig from the very first one, who played, who subbed in how much I paid the band. Early on, wow. it was sometimes it was like $2, and one of those dollars for each guy was out of my pocket. They didn't know that. Sure. But, and so the, I have the whole history of, of uh, everything that we did. But we started on Monday nights and then eventually moved to Thursday nights. We were playing weekly for years. And then the last club we were at, we did every other Thursday for 10 years. So we had a 10 okay. year run at that club and that was after two other clubs before that. Wow. So what are the places just cuz I'm curious I've it's been, a, been in, to Rochester many in times. In a little suburb of Rochester called East Rochester that my wife and I used to live in and uh, it's called a club called the Village Rock Cafe like this total dive bar place that mostly does cover rock bands. And the uh -huh. first you know the first few gigs were pretty rough even though I lived in in the village there. The, uh, yeah, they didn't like jazz, but you know, we won, we won in the end. And like these metal heads would come up like, I don't even know what you call this kind of music, but it's kind of cool. And things like that, that would, uh, yeah, yeah. eventually happen. We got mooned on the first gig. I mean, actually mooned and it was, I think that's a, I think that's a good omen. Actually. <laughs> it, it worked out well. That guy actually apologized years later. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's pretty funny. But yeah. So and then what? Where afterwards? Where was the most recent one? Uh, well, it was really just there, and then it's occasional we played Bop Shop. And so there's mm -hmm. actually there's a good footage up on YouTube of the entire Bop Shop show that we did, uh, whatever it was, a couple years ago maybe, when we celebrated 25 years of the Dave Ravello Ensemble. And so actually people can go check out that whole gig at Bop Shop. Oh, cool. So if they type in my name and Bop Shop, it should pull up the video. Mm -hmm. And you're still writing for that group. That's your group, and you, you still come up with new things. And you're, I, I imagine the weekly residency it gives you the opportunity to just come up with some new stuff on the, you know, on every other week or whatever. Try out new things and what have yeah, you. Yeah, and I look forward to getting back to actually doing a regular thing. But I had decided that, you know, I, I've written for, like I said, standard jazz orchestra. I've written commissions for regular size. I've got a bunch of stuff published for Alfred Publishing, like standard arrangements of mine and one original. And, but even before that, I just when I decided on the instrumentation of the, of the Dave Ravello Ensemble, I thought, what, what would be my dream instrumentation to write for the rest of my life that would be my work that wasn't for someone else or under the restrictions of, well, the lead trumpet can't go higher than this, or we can't have this, or you can't use this kind of harmony because they won't be able to hear that. And so it's a... It's my lifelong work to just create this body of work for my own ensemble. Mm. What drives you to keep writing? 
That's a good question. And I think if we go back to my book, when I asked Brookmeyer that, he said, because there's this weird ball of flesh inside of us that needs to do it. Something like that. And I think that, you know, that's always been the way for me to really express myself. And so that's how I'm, I'm happiest when I'm in the middle of a piece, even if I'm struggling with it. It's just, that's where I feel like that... Uh, I always say that I didn't choose to be a composer. It chose me, is mm. really how I think. So anybody looking to check out your music can uh, hear your album, Facing the Mirror. Uh, do you have any uh, records coming out or any projects in the works? I do. Uh, a couple of years ago, and it's probably more than that now, you know how time goes. Like I feel like we've all kind of lost a year with the uh, pandemic is like, does that one count? Do, am I, do I have to actually have like my birthday? We all just stay the same age one for one more because we kind of lost one. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, um, uh, a few years ago, I've been also, besides doing the Rochester international jazz festival here many times, I have been doing the Rochester fringe festival. And so the first one of those that I did, I guess it's four or five years ago now. Now what, what is the Rochester fringe festival? The Rochester fringe festival the, the original Fringe Festival, I think, started maybe in England. And so it's a f festival of a week. Actually, it's, I think, 10 days now here in Rochester. And it's all the arts. So there's music, dance, comedy, children's things, all kinds of stuff. And the whole city is just kind of buzzing. Oh, cool. with, uh, And so it's supposed to be a little more on the fringe, but that isn't necessarily what all of it is. But I... Wanted to challenge myself. I had never written a long form piece. And so I wanted to write an hour long piece. And so I went and actually was successful for once in getting funding to write an hour long piece for what is besides. So my Dave Ravello ensemble is my dream ensemble for that kind of group. And then the, the other dream ensemble is basically that as a core, but then with strings, extra percussion, harp, so a 37 specific 37-piece wow. group. Two French horns, mm. five woodwinds besides the reeds. And so using the three-pitch module approach from Brookmeyer, and that's how I compose all of my music now, and that's in the book as well. The mm. um, I started out with three pitches and wrote an hourless long piece of music that's in several movements called ellipsis and light. So each movement is something having to do with light. And we did two performances live, and I'm pretty sure that between those two performances, I have a live CD, and it was also with a projection artist. So the first time I collaborated with somebody doing visual. Oh, wow. Art. So I've been talk thinking about possibly trying to re mm -hmm. release it, uh, maybe with the video image, or who knows. But that's in the, that's in the works. And then... My Dave Ravello Ensemble, the other thing that I've done is two other fringe years, I did other hour-long pieces that I called DRE, Dave Ravello Ensemble, and then Red, which, you know, being nerdy, Red is the first rotation, if you think about musical rotation, so D-R-E, R-E-D, so first rotation of DRE, and that's a little bit more heavy rock-influenced with the same instrumentation, mm -hmm. except that... I use electric bass. I set the band okay. up differently, so we're not set up like a big band. It's in a different configuration. And so I have Red 1 and Red 2, two different basically hour-long programs. So one of those, at least, I think is releasable, plus the Dave Ravello ensemble that's in the can that I just haven't mixed yet. So those are kind of the things that are waiting for my attention. Great. New music coming out. We'll be looking forward to to hear it when it comes out. Uh, do you have, can you think of any, I want to put this right, do you have any advice for people who are coming up as composers, or are there things that really struck you, maybe either working with Brookmeyer or another context that really changed your worldview as a composer and set you on your path as it is? Um, yeah, I think a few things. One, I would say, depending on what part of the path you're in, but Early on, I think it's important to find a teacher, somebody to guide you that you you are drawn to their music. And maybe not even to have lessons with them, like we know lessons, but to have them 
give you listening lists because I think that listening is so important early on and I think that maybe that's not really talked about as much as it should be. You know, mm-hmm. I think we tend to think more, maybe more about that as improvisers and as instrumentalists than we do as writers. And I feel that there's, it's important to know who came before you in the same way, at least in a general understanding. And maybe you can find that information elsewhere, but I think from a writer you could find a path, and especially if it's a writer that you really are drawn to their music, I think that's an important thing to do. And then, you know, I love books, but I just, I remember both Ray Wright said, Rayburn Wright, one of the things he Mm -hmm. said is, you know, books are really just a summation of somebody else's experience. Have your own experience. And Brookmeyer loved books too. I mean, he, but he said, write music and then write music and then find a band that can play your music back to you in a reasonably accurate fashion and then write more music. And so I think that also doing it and not being caught up in thinking about it, talking about it. I mean, those are important things too, and they have their place, but doing it is more, and then hearing what the musicians tell you and being open to the feedback and maybe criticism, constructive criticism of how to get better. Beautiful. I think we made it. I think that wraps wraps it up. Great, Dave. (laughs) Great. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate your uh, your insight in all this and talking about the the book. It's really great, and uh, and your music, and we could go on and on forever. I think on some of this stuff. Yeah, no, it's good, it's and I hope that I, I, we can do that maybe live when New York gets back to, and I can travel there, and we can hang out and continue. And if you've got stuff I can read with my band, or maybe end up playing my Eastman band, let me know. Hit me up because I perfect. I'm, I'm all about it. I'll let you know next time. I'm, I'm in Rochester. I might be there before too long. Oh, that'd be well, great. Hopefully, as long as everything's back to normal, you know. Yep. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Th- Dave. Appreciate thank it. you. I'll see you soon. Take care. All right, gang. Well, thanks for checking out our show with the great composer, Dave Ravello. I hope you had a blast. Uh, we're happy to be back for the new season of Jazztopia. Uh, next week, it looks like our guest will be the composer Ayn Inserto, also a student of Bob Brookmeyer's. We're doing a little Bob Brookmeyer series here. And uh, we are going to continue on with new guests every Wednesday. We're going to do Wednesdays. We're going to be releasing the shows on Wednesday. So if you like the show, you want to follow us, keep up with it, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at, at Bob Spellman or on Facebook at Bobby Spellman Music. And uh, you can follow the Jazztopia SoundCloud page at soundcloud.com slash Jazztopia podcast. You can also check this out on uh, Apple iTunes, uh, Apple, wait, what is it? Apple Apple uh, Podcasts, on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. I just forget how many. They're out there. It's on everything. You can check it out on everything. We're around. Uh, so be sure to check that out uh, every Wednesday. We're going to be coming out with a new episode. All right, gang. All right. We'll catch you next week. Have a good one. See ya. See ya.